So we've already mentioned, you want to remember that we can only have one single locus of attention at any particular moment. If you have an interrupting event that's going to pull your attention from what you are trying to focus on, such as the confirmation process in Vista breaks your train of thought. Users don't like that. That's a major annoyance. And it also tends to cause more errors with what the user is trying to accomplish. So you want to remember, think about the consciousness and the unconsciousness. If, an, if outside or internal events are routine and not pressing, your unconscious recognizes the status and tends to ignore those events. But you're not conscious that you are ignoring them. Now, I think I mentioned in a previous class that you can train yourself to periodically scan the environment and turn that something like that into a habit. But in general, when it comes to things that are unconscious and habits, we tend not to veer away from them unless there is something that causes us to. And that can be good or that can be bad. Now, there's also something called absorption. I think I mentioned this also in a previous class. Do you remember what absorption is? When you the <laughs> I know you guys are so brilliant. I didn't have to stand here and start doing my, uh, my, uh, my stance to start pointing things out. All right. Yeah, it's basically when you become so absorbed in a task that it really has your complete locus of attention. Now, this is really important to productivity, especially these days where instead of an office where you can close the door and have silence, a lot of places have what? Cubicles, desk and, either desks out in the open or cubicles. Right? It's great for being able to talk to your uh, work neighbors, but it makes it much more difficult because it's very, can be very loud to focus on things. So we, but we can get really absorbed in it. You will find people who are sitting at their desk and they are just intently focused. And you pr practically have to come up, come up to them. They're so used to, to, to all of that noise and just ignoring it, you kind of have to kind of smack them upside the head. I didn't tell you that, by the way. Right, because they're very, very absorbed. So we do need that, but we want to remember the more absorbed we are in what we're trying to focus on, the harder it is to change that focus. Again, this can be a good thing or a bad thing. You need a greater stimulus when you are very absorbed. So again, remember, if I'm walking down the hallway and I don't acknowledge you, what's wrong? Absorbed. I'm absorbed. It has nothing to do with you. Now, here's the thing that's really interesting about absorption. We can be focused on something. Let's say we're focused on trying to finish a paper that, that uh, is due in two days. But there's an error that now pops up right on your computer, and you're like, what is that? What do most IT people do at that point? Do they click, OK, I'll deal with it later? No. It depends on the error. It does depend on the error. It's a new error. It's, Save it. Right, so if it's critically important or just really interesting, oh man, now what are you doing? Now you are absorbed in trying to, trying to fix the problem. What happened to what you were originally trying to do? You may even be out of sight, out of mind. Oh wait, the next day, oh crap. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say language like that. Oh, oops. Didn't finish that. So we need to remember that when we are designing systems, we want our users to become absorbed enough that they are able to accomplish things in an effective manner. But we don't want things that are so distracting that it takes away that locus of attention and causes them to be absorbed in something else. Oh, by the way, absorption is another great question for the midterm. Nice short answer question. So what are some of the things that cause absorption? Stress. So if you have that paper that's due, what are you feeling? 
stress. Right, so stress can cause you to be more absorbed, or if it's extremely high, it can actually hinder absorption. One of the things I say is a little bit of stress can actually be okay. It can actually increase your absorption. It can actually increase your ability to even remember things, as long as it's not extreme. Things like a computer's unexpected behavior. The example I just gave you with us with this uh, cool new error message. Or, as you mentioned, critical tasks. Right? You need to fix that. Now, another thing with critical tasks, if you are, let's say you are typing that paper, and you have an error message that pops up, but that paper is due in an hour, what do you think you're going to do to that error message? Assuming it's not that you can't save. You're going to disregard it. So again, it can go in either direction. Now, this is actually one of my favorite videos because it really shows you how our locus of attention affects how we interpret things, how we see things, how we remember things, and what we notice. Because magicians actually use this. When you see all these magicians and their illusions, right? They are really relying on our single locus of attention. Why? Because it takes us time. It takes us, what was it, about 10 seconds on average to switch from paying attention to one thing to something else. So this is actually a great video. This video, by the way, I hadn't seen it until one of the students in this class showed me. And we showed it for class. So if you have any good videos and stuff, let me know. How many of you have, have any of you seen this? Okay, a couple of you. Only two words. What is that? Talk about the average. The Mindy Project premiere. James uh, Franco. You're trying to have to be the cutest person in this office. Everybody loves me. The Mindy Project season premiere tonight on Fox. Sorry. <laughs> we did a um, we did a series of television shows. We saw magic all over the world, went to Egypt, China, and India. And every magician we saw had a version of the cups and balls. And uh, the trick all around the world didn't change very much, but the props did. And in China, they had these uh, metal cups handed down generation to generation. In India, they had these hand-carved wooden cups. But we used plastic cups because we were representing the United States of America. So these are the plastic we use. We also use for balls, we use tinfoil balls. So we have the totally American, totally disposable cups and balls. Goes like this. This is what it's done everywhere. Take the ball, we place it in our hand, we vanish it, and it appears underneath the cup. And that's why it's done all around the world. You just take the ball, we place it in our hand, we vanish it, and it appears underneath the cup. Here's a little variation Tilly came up with, where he takes the ball, places his hand, and shows you underneath the cup, yet it still appears wow. underneath the cup. So having a center ball placed visibly in the center cup, then you do side balls, put them anywhere we want, they still reappear in the center cup. you have already seen a little juggling here, but there's a little more of it. Then a giant ball in the center cup, one more giant ball on either side, and of course, for the finish, it's a baseball! As a very easy to hit. That's, that's the standard version of the cups and balls. After we did that for a while, we wanted to kind of zoom in and do a pen and teller version of the cups and balls, which involves breaking a few rules of magic. Well, the first rule of magic is you never do the same trick twice. You have the sense of that right away. You're going to get us out of there, don't do it again. We're going to do it again. Second rule is you never tell an audience how a trick is being done. So I'm going to tell you exactly how the trick is being done. The third rule of magic is you never let the audience see your secret preparation. They must not know what is hidden in which pocket. <laughs> and the fourth rule of magic is unwritten, but I think any magician in the world would agree with us in a second that you never ever do the cups and balls with clear plastic <laughs> cups. This is the pen and teller version of the cups and balls. We take the first ball, pretend to place it in our hand, have already stuck it underneath the first cup. Do the second ball simultaneously screen it underneath the cup, then place it in our hand, and show it. 
Take the third and final ball, pretend to place it in our hand, pretend to shoot the cup, replace it with the cup, then secretly secrete it and reveal it. Now we're all set for the second half. We cups all loaded, three balls on top. The center ball, please set a cup. These are the side balls ready to put them away. We don't need more. We have three duplicates in the set of cup. These two balls come over here. This is not juggling. This is called misdirection. For I look over here, tell us the final ball under one more in the side. And of course, for the finish, to American wow. Baseball! All right, so we saw all those steps. It was kind of confusing to follow. So yeah, I've, even, I've seen this multiple times. I still don't see all of the steps. But notice some of the things that they did, right? They went and tried to really, t really help us, I guess, really guide where our attention was going. Yeah. So when the most obvious one was when he was juggling the three balls, right? What are we doing? We're looking at him instead of what's going on in the background. I think you can do that in an interface, not juggle the balls. But, yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. And the user won't see it as having to wait for the system, because we don't like waiting. Oh, you mean like, the shuffling of the cards? like the shuffling of the cards. Or having us look at something up you know, in a different part of the screen. Yes? Many video games do that now, they have like a cut scene, and the background is loading. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the, yeah, exactly. So they'll have like a little scene where in the background it's loading. Mm 